Uh, good day, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not going to say good evening, good morning, because we have people all around the world join with us to meet Mr. Roy Anderson, an author, a famous educator, at the moment the principal of the Kingston College, and we, we have like 30 years of experience. So good evening, Roy. So he joined us from all, all the difficulties, so with sparing his valuable time. So the, our today topic is about future of education. So we are going to start the session now. So if you have any doubts, any questions, you can put it into the question and answer topic or in the chat box. So we are Roy is happy to answer all those questions. Okay, Roy, it's all to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And welcome to everybody. Um, if we're talking about the future of education, let's first of all do a little recap about education to understand where we're going. Education around the world still works on a 19th century political ideology to create either the manager or the managed in society. Now, the way it does that is that it processes children on language skills, not intelligence. To understand how it actually works, uh, we'll just go a little bit back. I'll, I'll just share a screen here. Uh, if I can, can you allow me to share the screen, the one? Uh, can you? Yes, I think. Uh, okay, now it's fine. Uh, now it's fine, yet. right? Not yet. Oh, there we go. There we go. There okay. We go. Okay. Good. So, okay. So, of course, in every country, we have, we have, we've always had people who are concerned about the development of children and how children can learn best. And if, for example, we look at America, well, on the left-hand side, of course, we have John Dewey. Now, do we believe very much in children learning what we today call critical thinking? And in his experimental school, he had small factories where children would, do, would, would learn things. They, they would weave, they would make colored dyes, and they would do hands-on things to think about what they were doing. And then, of course, we also had Watson. Now, Watson's very interesting as a psychologist, because Watson once made a statement in the 1920s where he said, give me any child, any child, and I can make that child any job, any profession, with a lawyer, accountant, a plumber, or a carpenter, or a cleaner. Now we'll come back to that in a moment because it's very important to understand what he was saying here. Basically, of course, that every child has the opportunity with the right circumstances to obtain any job in society. If we look at this 19th century design, it is, it is requirement that the society functions best when there are more capable people administrating the society and less capable people doing what they're told to do. And this is the reality of what school is and how it works. So then follow the American plan, we have Thorndike. Now Thorndike made a, his laws of learning and by basing, just let me turn this off. Thorndike made his laws of learning based on repetition, laws of repetition. And he did his experiments, not on children, but on rats. So he gave rats um, pain or he gave them a reward and he found they responded more to pain. So when he designed education, it was the children would learn by repetition and if they didn't put the effort in, then they'd be caned. <laughs> it was of course the instructor model that we've all used right up until the 1960s. And that enabled, but that enabled economically for a vast number of children to be taught by one teacher. And we still have this, of course, in many countries. And I, I know that uh, in India and Pakistan and, and maybe in Sri Lanka, there are very, very large classes, maybe 50 or 60 children, where there's one teacher giving information, telling the children to learn from a textbook. We'll come back to that in a moment. But the meaning then was, was that as our technology began to change, it was realized that we needed a more responsible citizen. So education changed. And then they took the, the idea of Jean Piaget. Now, now, while Thorndike had worked his laws of how children learn on rats, Piaget, he, le he, he devised his laws of how children learn on studying a snail. And he realized that as a snail moved through a different environment, so it changed its color. This gave him the idea that children can learn best if they adapt to their, by their own experiences, and so they should learn by their own experiences. 
This, so this was very important because it changed the role of the teacher from a disciplinarian, you know, beating children, into one who was kind of faded into the background to allow children to learn by themselves. This enabled education to say, great, children are learning by themselves, so they learn better. But the reality was that they didn't, because the child's ability to interact and to learn in school was dependent upon the home and background by which they'd been taught to think and by which they'd been guided through the parents. Now, in the 1970s, we then became aware of the work of Russian Lev Vygotsky. Now, Vygotsky was I kind of, he's my kind of a hero in a way because he brought out the need for the teacher to actually help the children to understand what they're doing. And of course, he devised his zone of proximal development. The blue area in the, in the circle is what the child knows. The yellow is what the child does not know. And the green is what the, is what the teacher helps the child to, to move into from their experiences. The reality, of course, is that when you go back to this situation, the, the ability of the teacher is very limited. And it is designed to be this way. Now, what we need to move on to is this kind of a design uh, where I, I'm drawn. And here, the teacher is completely able to be, entertain the minds of the children. I, I once said to some teachers that to be a, a teacher, you have to be an actor. And one teacher said to me, I, I, I'm not an actor, I'm a teacher. And he didn't understand what it meant because you have to entertain, you have to pull the minds of the child, you have to create some kind of fascination so that they will think more about you than the distractions playing on their mind and want to learn. And this kind of a classroom enables you to have that opportunity and also to have a one-to-one -one eye contact. When you're teaching, if you can't read the eye of the child or the student, you don't really know if they're focusing on what you're able to say. When you're focusing, when you're reading the eye, then you can change your manner, your tactic, your strategy to teach in a different way if you feel that you're not making that count. But so where are we going? We've taken this very brief account of where we are today, where basically in many, in many instances, a teacher still tells the children to, oh, to work from their textbook. Not all teachers, but there is still a general trend where the teacher will come into the classroom, tell the teacher, sorry, tell the children to, open their textbooks and work from page 40, whatever it is. The problem there is that they are limiting the child to how well they understood the previous pages and how well they're able to understand the language of the textbook. Now, I advocate that we don't use textbooks, but that the teacher themselves learn what's in that textbook and, and teaches that in the language and to the experiences of all the children. And we have devised ways of doing that. This pandemic hit us all unexpectedly. We, we, we were not expecting it, you know, I, I certainly wasn't. And then suddenly, all, everyone had to, we, we had went into a lockdown, all the schools closed, and teachers were forced to teach online. Now to some teachers, that wasn't a problem, but to many, many teachers, it is a problem. Not only because they're not very confident in, in you know, uh, operating this system, but it's very, it's very difficult to get the children to respond. And of course, now the parents realize how effective the, the teacher is. Before that, the, the, the parents would drop the child off at school, pick them up at the end of the day, believe that the teacher had taught them something, they'd have a happy time with their friends. Now the, the teacher teaching online is under constant surveillance by the concerned parent as if they're teaching in the right way, doing the right thing. What the parent doesn't understand is that it's very difficult to get the concentration of the child online because the children are distracted. And also we, could, we, we kind of live in a mindset where the child goes to school where they, where they expect to be with their friends or with the children who disturb them, whatever it is. And this is the learning environment. But when they're home, home is the free time where they can play their games, where they can do what they want to do. And it is difficult to get some students to actually sit down and lock in and be responsive on an on a, on a online situation. So we can talk more about that. But the point here is, where is education going? What worries me very much is the development of digital interface. You know, in America, they've 
it tried to use a system called virtual classrooms where children learn from home but they don't go to school. And it's a big disaster for two reasons. It was found out that the children who, who benefited from this virtual classroom only did so when the mother was sitting right next to them, making sure that the child was responsible, was on time, and was interfacing uh, with their capability, with the teaching, with the, uh, with the information. If the parent was not there, well, the kids were playing games <laughs> or whatever it is. But 60% of uh, kids failed the grade on this virtual classroom. Now, the problem we are facing in the West is that we are losing teachers very, very, very fast because of politicians changing the curriculum, changing examinations, because the children coming to school are less respectful. Therefore, it's very, sometimes very dangerous in the classroom. So the, the joy of moving into a classroom to help enlighten minds is very, very difficult atmosphere in the West. A friend of mine told me that in America, they lose, in effect, 200,000 teachers every year. They lose 250, they train 110, but 50% of those, or sorry, 40% of those, don't go into education once they're qualified, they go into industry. So they're actually, in effect, losing 200,000 teachers every year. And I think it was the state of Arizona, but I'm not so sure, where there was 1, 200 years, sorry, two years ago, there was 1,300 empty classrooms because there wasn't enough teachers. So, and of course, in England, we have, uh, we have the similar situation. 25% uh, of new teachers left within five years on the job because it wasn't what they thought it would be. Now, if we're losing the human teacher, then the system is quite happy to do that because it's saving money and it can reason that, well, we don't need a teacher, we can use you know, a software programs. The problem with this is that learning needs to be, have a human experience. Anybody, any child can learn to press something and respond with a, a light, but it's the drive. You know, learning is, is, the, is the humanness. It is the inspiration that comes from within you because you believe in yourself, because there's a kind of a social atmosphere where you feel confident and you feel happy. And children just learning from software programs, they don't get that. But it also means that when they leave this educational platform and they go into the world, that they're less able to relate to human issues. It's very easy to see today, you know. I remember uh, two years ago, I was in England and I, I had a problem and I called some company. And this lady said to me, well, you don't fit into this box. You don't fit into this box. You don't fit into this box, so I can't help you. And I said, well, okay, just give me the manager. And she said, do you know the manager's name? I said, no. She said, well, you can't talk to the manager. That was it. And we, we, we have to be so careful that in, in every sense, we are controlling our humanity, our social experience. You know, in a, a talk a couple of days ago, somebody said to me, what effect is artificial intelligence having on human intelligence? And my answer was very simple. If you look at any home, you go into any home, and you'll see the child doing this. It's the mother and the father doing this with very little human interaction, very little social interaction. The meaning here is that they are losing the ability to share their feelings and relate to the feelings of others. And so if we have an educational system which becomes out of balance with the human teacher and the digital teacher, and the children and the families are raised at home on this kind of a software, then the future generation will be less able to relate to human issues. Now, this is tremendously important to realize because the world of our children is going to be more by artificial intelligence. Ours already is. I, I know that when I was 20, uh, the world that I lived in was totally different than it is today. Incidentally, I worked in Japan for nine years. And I remember the, um, the first year I went in, I went into a government office. And I was amazed to find that these Japanese employers all had stacks of paper. There's huge amounts of paper. No, no computers, which really surprised me because it was Japan. But in the course of a couple of years, the papers had disappeared, and everybody, of course, was using their computers to do their office work. Um, without getting into the 
problems that we get from this electronic, you know, strain on our eyes, the, the disturbance to our brain patterns caused by this radiation from phones and from the computers. We need to be hold on to the, to the danger that we are moving into in education because education is the, the system has already, is now invested because of this COVID-19 into digital equipment. They have bought uh, applications, they have bought into ways of assessing online. So there is a mentality within the hierarchy of education to begin to think of the human teacher as being less important. And this is a great danger. This is very, very much a great danger. And so what I would really suggest is that once this COVID-19 does stop, and we go back to reality, that we really resist the school board or whoever it is, suggesting that we maintain a kind of a hybrid system, teach on class, but also teach at home. Because if you're a teacher, you know how stressful it is to try to organize the class, to try to teach online when the students online aren't really interested in you because you don't have that personal relationship. You can't impress them with your persona. And at the same time, your own children are running around saying, mom, I want this, and whatever, like this. It's very chaotic. So we really have to resist this hybrid education that may come out of this um, COVID-19. Where then is education going? I, I, I can see that we are going to phase out, begin to phase out the, the human teacher. And when I first began to write about this in 1980, I was really writing that we must be so much aware that we don't do that. We retain the human teacher. Because as I've pointed out before, the, the learning is not just relating to information, it's having the desire to want to relate to information. Now, let's, having said that, let's look at how education still works today. And, um, uh, okay, I just changed this uh, screen here. Oopsie daisy, okay. <clears throat> Now, basically what happens is that you see here a teacher, um, can, can you see the, can you see the screen? No one? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so here you can see a teacher helping the children to learn to write or draw the letter A. It's an example. It can be anything, you know, calculus, whatever, whatever it is. Now, what's important here is the little girl, well, she loves the teacher. She feels very happy with the teacher and she kind of wants to be like the teacher. So she wants to do her A as good as the teacher's. Now the boy is happy and he is also uh, content, but his mind's on other things. He wants to go and play football. So he's thinking, uh, oh, I'm waiting for the bell to ring then I can go and play with my friends and do the A, waiting for the bell, do the A. Oh, we had a great, guy, a great game last week. And the, so his, his mind is drifting. This is lack of concentration. And so you see how he draws his A. Now, the meaning here is that in this lesson, his ability was, was decided by his ability to focus or to concentrate on what he was doing. That's all. But at the end of the lesson, the teacher says, well, everybody's done the A their way. So next lesson, we'll go on to the B's or whatever it is. Now, the problem for this child is that the next lesson and the next year, this, his performance will be said to be his ability. Now, what I'd like to explain to you is that when I was a child in school, I really didn't understand what was happening. I was insecure. I, I, I wasn't able to question my teacher. <laughs> I was more keen than anything else. And when I was 16, they said, Roy, you're not clever enough to do mathematics. You must do arithmetic. <laughs> And so when I was 17, I took my examinations in English, arithmetic, history, geography, and all these things. I failed every single one. I got zero, completely zero. Well, things happened for me. And when I was 20, I went back to school. And this time it was totally different. This time I was the top student in the first year. When I left, I had extremely high qualifications. But it was a great 
great lesson for me to understand how the school system worked and the importance of the individual student taking their own responsibility for their learning. Now, this has a socioeconomic factor because parents from better backgrounds or better educated backgrounds, they'll be more aware of the need to teach their children before school how to be prepared for school. They'll teach them to read and write and do mathematics and colour, take them on excursions. In fact, Risley and Hart found in 2005, in 1995, that um, children who come from academic parents have something like 30 million words more in their vocabulary than children who come from normal parents. I don't know, you might say that's 20, 80, you know, whatever it is, depending upon the technology. But it means that these children not only had a huge amount of words more, but most important is they had a mental stamina to understand how to interact with school. Now, you know very well that children live in a three-dimensional world, run, laugh, to play, happy, and cry, whatever it is. In school, it's two-dimensional. School is sit down, you, you, you cannot stand up without permission, you must pick up the pen with your right hand, you must write from left to right, or whatever your language is. It's, it's just a question of rules. I think it was Einstein who said that to be good in schools, to be good in school, you have to learn the rules and learn them better than anyone else. And this is very important because in understanding how children learn in school, it is to understand that it's got nothing at all to do with intelligence. So any normally born child can obtain very, very high grades in school, which is what Watson was saying in 1920 when he said, if you give me any child, I can, make, I can help him to do any job. How then does school really work? Well, there are three factors in the development of the child's ability. First of all, it's the importance of the parent at home. The emotional atmosphere by which the parents create for their child. Unfortunately, some children have a very hard time in, school, in home. And school can be a safer place for them than the home environment. But for the normal child, they are more well, today, as I've just mentioned, there's very little stimulation. They are, but it's, it's so important that a child is raised by parents who are emotionally happy with each other. I know so many children who suffer because their parents got divorced. I, I know that, it, and it's, it, it plays on their mind when they're trying to learn. And I'll explain that in a moment. So the role of the parents is very, very important in the development of the child's ability in school, where the parent gives them a sense of orientation, to know who they are and how to adapt themselves with confidence to a different environment. This is the key to real learning. For me personally, I didn't realize that until after school, I joined the army and there I learned a sense of discipline, but also a kind of self-respect for myself that gave me the courage to argue respectfully with my later teacher if I didn't understand something. So this ability of the student to have confidence within themselves to respectfully argue with the teacher is fundamental to their development. If you think that, I, if I say to you the word chair, now in my mind I've got an image of a chair and you will have an image of a chair for you. Oh, sorry. So I keep forgetting to flip over. Okay. Uh, so in my mind, I will have an image of a chair. Can, oh, wait a minute. Okay. Now you're seeing me now. Yeah? Yeah? No one? Can you see me? Yeah, okay. I'm sorry. I, 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 I didn't realize that. I'll so if I, have, if I say the word chair, in, I know what a chair is in your mind. You will have a chair too. It's only by language. It's only by discourse, by talking to each other, that we can find a common understanding for chair. And this is what's too often missing in education. The ability of the child to relate to the mind of the teacher or whoever's providing the information is supposed to learn. This transference of information is fundamental to the development of children. I remember once, I, in 1996, I went to uh, study with a professor in Israel. Now, Fuerstein had developed a very, very um, important cognitive training system. And when I went to meet him, I, I was amazed that there were these 
professors, and they were really fighting with each other. I thought they were going to kill each other, but they were really, what I realized they were doing, it was that they were fighting to understand the mind of each other with such ferocity that it made me really understand the importance of language. You can only learn if you can, if you can adjust your brain patterns to the information of another person or, or to the information that's being presented to you. It's only by this kind of mechanical movement of brain cells that you can actually understand, you can learn. So this uh, importance of the parents is fundamental. The other, the second one, of course, is the learning environment, the classroom. Now, the classroom tends to be a very competitive environment because students at all ages, including adults, want to be recognized by the teacher because they feel that if the teacher likes them, well, the teacher will give them a better mark. Um, and, and of course, unfortunately, some children uh, develop Machiavellian strategies to cause other children to, be, to, to, be, to fail more. They'll bully them, they'll intimidate them, they'll hurt them, so that the child can't concentrate as well, so that they can concentrate better and get better marks. It's the reality of what a classroom can often be. And thirdly, of course, it's the teacher. Now we have fantastic teachers around the world, but teachers are human beings, and we have average teachers, and we have some teachers who should not be teaching at all in consideration of the responsibility they have for the development of a human being. So if we come back to this factor here, um, this screen here, okay. now you can see the screen again. Right. Now, as I said to you, the boy's ability was hindered because he wasn't concentrating. The problem then was the, the, the system. Everybody then said, well, that's his ability. Now, when I began my study of um, human in intelligence, let me get back a bit. I've got to, I've got to, excuse me if I'm flip-flopping too much. I, I, I just want to show you these images. You see, when I was 17, I failed school completely. I got zeros. When I was 24, I had incredibly high. I got... 92% of applied mathematics at pre-university. And, and I'm, I'm sure that at, when I'm 24, the, my, my educators would have thought, wow, Roy's got a very high genetic count. Whereas at 17, they said, Roy's got a very low genetic count. And in my 30s, when I decided to dedicate my life to help children in school, because I never wanted any child to fail as I'd done, it was, I, I would talk to teachers and I'd say, why are these children very well, why don't they all get top marks? Why don't they all understand what's happening? And the response I would get from the teachers is, well, you know, there are socioeconomic differences, but they're born different. And I really thought, you know, when I was 17, they said I was born stupid, and when I was 24, they said I was born whatever it is. Is it true? Do we really inherit a factor of inheritance, uh, intelligence? So I studied intelligence over 30 years. And I've written a book which proves why intelligence is not genetically inherited and how the concept of genetic inheritance is built upon a 19th century political design. There's a video I've made about this on my YouTube. You can go to YouTube, Roy Anderson Education. There's nearly about 100 videos there that are free for anybody who's interested in learning school or intelligence. Now, just let me go back to this screen here. And so we go to the situation now where the teacher believes that this child does the A their way. This is their ability. This is a very big problem we have in school because once the teacher starts thinking that's their ability, they accept it. So you can see here a text that was written by a girl who'd been in school for eight years. Now, there's nothing wrong in this text. The, 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 Information is very correct. But look at the presentation. Uh, you know, she gets half marks. She's always had half marks. She doesn't expect to get any higher because students, children, believe in the competence of the teacher. So when the teacher gives a mark, the student will accept that and be, and be conditioned by that mark to believe their ability, which is a very big, important psychological problem we need to understand. So I said to this girl, I want to show you how to write beautifully. And I taught her how to write calligraphy. You know, like this. 
and I showed her how to do an A and a B. And she said to me, wow, that's so beautiful. Now, when she said to me, it's beautiful, I knew then that she had a purpose to want to write better. So I helped her, you know, at the end of a lesson, five minutes in here and 10 minutes there, just short, just a little short help, that was it. And, she, and because she wanted to do it, then she put the time in in the evening. It for her, it was she was painting a, a masterpiece. And that's exactly what she did. Because for eight years, the teacher was accepting what she did as this boy. That's his A. That's her ability. But after two weeks, just two weeks, she wrote that. And now she gets top marks. And because she gets top marks, she believes in herself. And therefore, she's interested and excited. You see how we teach is what they become. So if we're going to understand the teaching process, then we need to understand how education really works. And it is, and it is to understand that it works on rules. Now, there are two rules by which the school mechanism works on. One is mathematics, and the other is the language of the country. Be it, you know, English, French, German, whatever the language happens to be. Now, these languages work on rules. So the child who knows the rules of mathematics to transpose numbers about, the child who knows, uh, am I muted now? That's okay. The child who learns the rules of mathematics to know how to transpose numbers about, well, they'll be very good in mathematics and they'll be good in the applied sciences, you know, chemistry, physics, because they are formulas. So it's very important to realize that if you know the rules of how to think, then you know, then you can, then you, you've got the tools to, to do that thinking. So if you're given a learning task, you know how to move your mind. And then for you can solve your own problems, then you're inspired, then you believe, oh, I am good at this, therefore I love it, therefore I am creative. This is where creative comes. You spend so much money in the West on creative classrooms, you know, big science, we are creative, and we provide, provide a lot of implements for the children to learn with thinking, ah, oh, this will make them creative, like robotics, or whatever it is. But the creativity in the human being comes from a belief that you know you're good at something and you enjoy doing it. That's where the creativity comes from. And so if teachers understand that if you're going to, if you want to make a creative human being, if you want to make learning the school creative, then make sure the children learn the rules. The problem, of course, is that from day one, children will come from different home environments, as I've explained. So some children will be better prepared for the school way of thinking than other children. It's very obvious if you go to a playgroup or kingdom. You've got some children who listen quietly and others are running around, you know, chaotic. Um, but then the problem is that with every year that moves on, so if, for example, in year one, you'll have some children who learned the rule, you'll have some who didn't. You go to year two, well, the children who didn't learn the rule in year one will be struggling to understand how to think in year two, and it's a progressive system. So we need to help our children to learn to understand these rules. Now, the rules of the language, French, German, whatever it is, is to learn the rules of how to spell a word, the rule of grammar, grammar and syntax, and the rules to know how to tell a story. This is fundamental. If we want to help children to learn better, then we must impress upon all parents the importance of storytelling. I hear that, you know, very many people say that Finland has the best educational system in the world. Well, I've met some Finnish teachers and they can be as bad as anybody else. What we need, you know, I lived in Denmark for 10 years and we did research into the way children learn in the Scandinavian countries, Norway, Sweden, Finland and Denmark. And Teachers are not trained really any different. The school mechanism really isn't very different. They all follow um, a particular design because they're just, these are socialist countries rather than capitalistic countries. So the, the design of the cities is, is different. But what is different is that in Finland, when a mother has a baby, she's given a box of books by the government. And this box contains stories, books. So, so, sorry, books that tell the mother how to read stories and stories to read. 
So the Finnish mother is sitting with a small child, you know, six months old, whatever, on her lap, reading stories, developing the child's recognition to words, developing, as we said, word vocabulary, helping the child to relate to different scenarios, and then able to express their mind with a great fluidicity, with, you know, being very fluid. Now, if you go to the other Scandinavian countries, which don't have this supposedly great intelligence, uh, sorry, educational system, go to Norway, Sweden, or Denmark, the mothers don't read stories like that. Instead, they give the children this to play with, and they turn the TV on. And a very big problem was that in Denmark is that many children fall asleep in front of the TV, and then the mother carries them to bed. This uh, storytelling is fundamental to the child's development. I told my children stories every night, every night for one hour. You know, I would go, when I would go to, the, to the younger child, first I'd read stories for one hour, and then to the older child, I, I, I'd tell stories again for another hour. I did that until I was about 14, and then, then they, they locked the door to stop me coming in and telling them stories. Um, so this um, ability of the teacher to make sure that the children keep up with the rules is really the purpose of teaching. The purpose of teaching, you know, you can't teach, you can't teach another brain to learn. You can inspire a brain to learn. And that's what many teachers really fail to understand. Unfortunately, some teachers think they should be disciplinary. You know, they should have a sense of authority where they, where they instruct the children to do that. And that doesn't work because you have to understand that for the brain to learn, for the mind to learn, it has to have a sense of security. It has to be able to be calm and relaxed and feel that it can question information. And a child who's in a classroom with a strict teacher feels uh, nervous. They, they don't have the strength to, uh, compl well, to interact with the teacher, so they can't learn very well. But let me give you a very simple example of this uh, rule I was talking about. <clears throat> so you can see here this equation of six divided by two, two plus one. Now we're going to look at two students, one who was not concentrating when the teacher was explaining the rule. They were thinking about something else. So we look at this young man here. Uh, when the teacher was explaining the rule, his mind was on different things. Maybe he was worried about something. Maybe he was thinking about a girl. Or maybe he was going to play with his, his friend, you know, computer game, whatever it is. But he wasn't concentrating. So he didn't understand the rule. So, um, so he uses logic. He says, well, 2 plus 1 is 3. And 6 divided by 2 is 3. So 3 times 3 is 9. It's great. He doesn't understand why he's wrong, because it's logical. But the child who learned the rule of Bodmas, well, he knows that the rule is number one, you must do the brackets, two plus one is three. Number two, you must do the multiplication, two times three is six. And number three, you do the division, six divided by six is one. So this, is, this has got nothing to do with intelligence. It's just simply understanding the rule and, and practicing, practicing them so you become proficient in them and having experience with that. Now, let me stop this here. Now, therefore, when we, if we go back to the classroom, one of the problems that teachers have or teachers create is that they will give an example and they'll say to the children, okay, who knows the answer? And maybe two or three, you know, of course, in the, in the first year, everybody puts their hands up. <laughs> but as you get progressively older, then one or two will put their hand up. And the teacher will say, okay, what's the answer? And the student will, will give their answer. And the teacher says, great, now we move on. What they don't realize is that the other students, they're not interested in hearing this information from their colleague, who is a kind of com competition. And they can't really hear very clearly. So they can't lock into this exchange of information. The teacher has failed to teach all the class. Now, we're going to talk now, go back to here and about the importance of the classroom, because this is fundamental here. Just let me... Now, if you consider the classroom as, as an organization of minds, <clears throat> and remember, the purpose of this classroom 
is to make sure that some children get a better opportunity to learn than other children. The children in the front row will be closer to the teacher. They can hear better, they can see the board better, but more importantly, they can feel the persona of the teacher, so they like the teacher. Now remember when I showed you the little girl doing the A, it's the same here. She loves the teacher, therefore she wants to be like the teacher. It's this closeness, which of course, you know, digital programming or digital learning will uh, deprive the student of. But the students further back, well, they can hear, but they can't hear as well. They can't see as well. And so they have the less opportunity compared with the children in front. Now, of course, well, we, we realized that having you know, so many children in the class was not effective, so we made the classes smaller. But we don't realize we still have the same problem. The children at the back, they can't see or they can't hear as well, but the child in the front, she has that closeness, that special relationship with the teacher that makes her feel more competent, and that's so important. When I talk to you about the rules of learning, if you learn the rules, you know how to think, you can negotiate through the learning task. But if you don't learn the rule, if you don't hear that rule, if you misunderstand that rule, or you don't practice it, you don't know how to think. And therefore you see the other students, they're doing their work, and you think, oh, they can do it and I can't, therefore they're better than me, therefore I'm no good, therefore I hate this subject, I want to go home. Um, so this is this is this um, is so important for the teacher to be able to give confidence for the children to believe in themselves. Now I told you that I failed arithmetic, you know, two plus one is whatever it is. When I was seventeen, when I went back to school at the age of twenty, my maths teacher was a very great man, and he took us all right down to the very very beginning, so we would learn you know fractions with it. But most importantly, he would come along to me and he would say, Roy, you know, you can do this. Now, he didn't say it many times, but those few gentle words of, you can do it, made me believe that I can. And that gave me the confidence to solve the problems. You know, he would say to me, you know, I'm doing a math problem. He would say, Roy, Roy, what are you doing? And I said, I don't know. He said, look, it's just a game. Now, when he said it's a game, suddenly that stress, of the situation disappeared. It wasn't something that I was going to be executed by if I failed. And then he said to me, look, you're given the information, but some of it's hidden. You have to find what's hidden to solve, it, to, you know, to work, to, to win the game. And with that mentality, then I learned to relax, calm down, and begin to look for, the, you know, how to solve the problem. Of course, then I became very, very good in mathematics. Now, if we look now at the learning situation, we have rows of classes, uh, ro rows of desks. I want to impress upon you how this prevents the teacher from teaching the minds of the students and developing them. Now you can see here, I, I'm in a classroom and uh, in the design of the classroom, it was not possible to change these desks. I'll explain to you in a moment how we should change it, but it wasn't physically possible in this room. Now, you can see there's an, there's an aisle in the beginning by this situation. To be by the board, giving instruction, telling the students what to listen to learn. The ones near me, well, they can, they're interested. The ones at the back, well, they're drifting their minds on different things. They're not interested. But the important thing here is that the, the layout of the desk prevent me from helping the children nearest the wall. I can help the children in the aisle, but the ones near the wall, I can't physically reach. I can't touch them. So this teaching conditions me. So what I must do then is that at the end of the lesson, I collect all the textbooks and I go to the staff room and I mark them. Now let me show you what really happens here. I went into one staff room and there were 40 books which the teacher had marked and I picked up one. Now, each child had written about 40, 40 lines. And you see here, there are five lines that I've shown you by example. And the teacher's marked it. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. And he gets to the bottom and he said, okay, now, you know, visual mark, see me later or whatever it is. But the important point here is that in these five lines, 
and remember there are 40, he's made no development to the child. If you look at the bottom of the screen, you can see um, six words in red. Now these are the words, these are the, the, the correction he should have made on those five lines. But of course he doesn't have time. Let me get us back right here. So he doesn't have time to, to go through the whole 40 lines of 40 students making all these corrections. And even if he did, and he gave them back, you know, one week later, well, the children aren't interested, it's finished. They're not interested. All they're interested in is if they've got less red marks than the person sitting next to them, or if they've got a higher mark. So if we can go, go back here. So if you can understand now that we are, we are processing children on their language skills without developing that language skill, then you can begin to realize how we're still maintaining this 19th century processing so that some children, especially those who come from the better educated parents, are the ones who can get into university, whereas the others do not go into university, they go to college or whatever. Now, just let me come back. It is to understand that those who go to university, there they are taught evaluators thinking. There they are taught real critical thinking. They are taught this to be more responsible in the society as the government or the, the managers in the industry, commerce, and whatever it is. Those who don't go to university, they're deprived of this high reasoning skill because traditionally society doesn't want them to think too much. They want the general citizen to be compliant and not disruptive with the, with the managing sector. This is, how the, this is how our civilization works. But if we go back to here now, I'm getting a bit cross-eyed with these screens, but if we go back to this here. So if we go from this desk, these rows of desks, which of course, you know, I mean, you can see the problem here, you know, what it's like for these children. It's very easy to understand how these minds can't connect with the teacher. But if you change this physical arrangement of the desks to something like this, then the whole ball game changes. Now, in about 95% of classes I go into, I can create some kind of a desk arrangement like this. Sometimes, as I've just explained, it's not possible. But with this kind of an arrangement, then the teacher is able to move around the students. They have direct eye contact with each student. So when they're asking them a question, they know if that student understands them because they can read the eyes. Therefore, they know to change the strategy of how they're explaining something if that student doesn't understand. But also here, they are more connected. They are more a human being. And as I explained to you, teaching should always be fun. I'll explain to you a little bit why uh, a, bit, uh, a bit later. But this way, the teacher has the ability to make the correction at that moment and not at the end of the lesson, you know, of the, of the next lesson. Because when you go to this system, you can't change them. They're, it's gone, they're not interested, it's finished. But if you can catch them with the moment they make that mistake, then bit by bit, lesson by lesson, over the year, you do make a real development in the ability and the language ability of the children. And remember, that's all we evaluate them on, how well they explain their language. Whether it's verbal, whether it's written, we evaluate a student's competence on how well they explain their mind. A student who has a high language ability, even if they don't know the answer, can present their mind in such a way they'll get a reasonable mark. But if you know the answer and you have a poor language skill, you know, you get less a mark. And then you'll think that you're not good. And then this is the biggest problem in education for the student at any level to feel that they are good, they have a level of competence and they can do it. There was a lady called Carol Dureck, sorry, Dureck, and she spent 30 years analyzing the student response to teachers. And she found that if the teacher um, says something like, um, this is great, this is great, I like what you've done then that creates a fixed mindset where the student says, great, I'm great, that's it, finished, no more. But if the, student, if the teacher says to them, this is interesting, I really, I, I like very much what you're doing, 
then this creates a mindset of encouragement where the student feels, oh, this is good, I'm going in good, therefore I'm happier to, to develop. This mindset's tremendously important. You know, when I move across a crowd of students, I always say to them, in different ways, of course, yeah, this is good, hey, I like that, that's fun. You'll be surprised how those few words of encouragement really enable the student to believe in themselves. Um, go back to the screen. Uh, I remember, if I can find, I've got, what, about 300 slides here, just, it's all talk about brain develop, whatever, but, oh, here we go. I, I remember there was a maths lesson, and there was one student, she just sat there doing nothing. And I said to her, you know, what's the problem? She said, I can't do this, I'm not as good, the others are better than me. So I went to Google and I took some pictures and I made this arrangement in the next lesson. I said, oh, look, on the top, all these pieces of cake look different. But really, the second photograph, well, they're all the same, you know, oh, they're all the same. But then thirdly, the, the big cake at the bottom, I said, but you know, I think yours is really special. Now, I didn't know what to expect from that, but what I found out, was that in the next lesson, she stopped looking at how well she thought her friends was doing and began to concentrate on what she was doing because she had a belief in herself. And at the end of the year, she came third in mathematics. This, is, this ability is tremendously important. Unfortunately, there are teachers who say to the students in front of all the other students, you are no good, you're stupid. You know, I was in Algeria, which is a huge country, and one lady called me from the south of Algeria, 1,000 miles away. I was in the north, in the city. And she said, Roy, could you please teach me to be a teacher? And I said, well, yes, you know, if you, if you come. And she said, I can't come, it's 1,000 miles away. And I said, well, you can find a teacher at training school uh, near you. She said, no, no, I, I don't want an Arab teacher, I, I want you. And I said, well, you know, what's the problem? And then she explained to me that it had always been her dream to be a teacher. She'd always wanted to be a teacher. And she saved up the money, she went to teach training college. And in the course of the training, one instructor said to her in front of all the other students, you are so stupid. And that so hurt her that she ran away. She went home and she gave up her dream of being a teacher because that one person had criticized her and it hurt her. And um, I remember in England, you know, you know I, I hear so much when I'm in India and Nepal and Pakistan, whatever, I, I, you know, these, I meet these teachers, say, wow, you know, you come from England, I have so great educational system over there. <laughs> it is not, it is absolutely terrible. If you, you know, I, I really need to explain to people, do not think, that another country has a better educational system than yours because they've got a bit more money. What comes down to is the teacher teaching in the classroom. You can have a teacher teaching in the poorest, poorest part of New Delhi and they can, be, they can produce brilliant students, whereas you can have a terrible teacher in Cambridge, England, who produces very poor students learn. It's the quality of the teacher, not the educational system. So if we go back to the screen. I'm getting a bit confused where we're going now. Now, <clears throat> so once the student has learned the rules and practiced them, then they have confidence to explore. They have creativity, they have insight, and they have ingenuity. Now, this uh, graph that I present to you now, it's called the bell curve, or the standard distribution curve. It is supposed to show intelligence. So on the, on the left side, there was a, a population. This is the number of students. And on the bottom, you see the ability. So on the bottom, it would go an intelligent from zero to 200. Now I've completely disproven this, and I can, would willingly uh, talk about that another time. But however, in a classroom, you can see that on the right-hand side, there's a dark blue arrow. And we see a few students. Now, these are the smart kids. These are the clever people. You know, the teacher asks the question, oh, I know the answer. 
because they've kept up with the rules, because they knew they're in front, and that that prompted the ego to want to stay there. So they put the effort in to keep up with what was happening. So when a teacher asks them a question, they know how to, they, they make the connections very fast in their mind. But you can see the, the, the light blue, big arrow. This is the most, this is the average. And most of the students are generally confused because they didn't keep up with the rules. Therefore, they were distracted and bored and fed up and they lost this concentration. And of course, on the, the red, well, they're the, they're the stupid kids. This is where I was for 12 years. I did, they don't understand. They, they were confused. They lost. But, you know, they, they didn't understand. I was in one country, and it's, uh, there's a lot of political trouble in this country, and there's a lot of soldiers there. And um, one headmaster said to me, boy, I've got a class of 16-year-old kids. They are, they're always stupid. You can't control them. And I went into this class, there was about 50 children, and you can imagine what 50, 16 year olds is like. They were, they were silly, you know? They, and the teachers were shouting at them and punishing them. And they just, children didn't respond. And I, I gave the kids a kind of motivation talk. And I thought at the end of this, I should go and personally say, you know, goodbye, thank you for coming. So I went to the door and as each one, I shook hands or you know, whatever it was, and I said, you know, thank you. But when I got close to them, I could see the eyes. And the eyes of every single one of those children was crying. Their heart was crying. Because they are raised in a social environment which is intimidating, which is threatening, which is disturbing. So when they come to school, they can't concentrate. And so they don't understand the rule. They don't know what's going on. And as one lesson moves to another, you know, lesson by lesson, year by year, they're completely lost. And if you're 16 years old and you're trapped in a classroom for 90 minutes or 45 minutes, you don't understand what's happening, you're going to be stupid. It's as simple as that. So I explained to the principal the importance of making sure the teachers retrain the minds of these children to keep up with the rules, you know, bit by bit, keeping them up. Let me go back to the screen again. <clears throat> Uh, it's <clears throat> so, um, yeah. So, I really ask you if you're a teacher watching this or a principal, whatever, please try to create some kind of a, an environment, a learning environment, where the teacher is able to. Be like an actor on a stage. Um, <clears throat> now, one of the things that we need to understand is not really how well students can learn, because all students can learn. We're all intelligent. You know, I, I I've often would go into, a, you know, when I travel around, I've been traveling around the world, I would go to a classroom and the teacher would say, Roy, this is my, my best student. She is so clever. She's intelligent. She's brilliant. And then you see other kids looking around, you know, further back in the rows, looking more lost, confused, bored, and of course the troublemakers at the back, messing around. They're all intelligent. Every single one of those children are intelligent. But if, but if, if they got lost in the learning, if they got confused, if they misunderstood what the teacher was talking about, then, then, <coughs> then they, they lost the ability to keep up with it. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is why, if we go back to um, this again, okay, this environment. Now, I believe that the teacher should not be an instructor, but more like a comrade. You know, teachers have this kind of a fear of being corrected. Um, and I know that um, they often have, you know, they, they are, they do their training, they get a certification, and that's it. I'm a teacher now, I know everything. And they are very wary or frightened of criticism from their colleagues or from parents, you know. And so they, they tend to hide behind this professionalism. But the reality is we are just all human beings and we learn from each other. I learn most from small children. So when I'm in a class, you know, I'm more like a comrade. I go in.
and then they give me suggestions how they think they could learn it or they would like to learn it. Maybe some of it's wrong, but you know, if they can be very smart, they can think of something you didn't think about. But the point is that when you're getting them to give a responsibility, there's certainly it's their thing that they're developing, so they're more interested. So try to think about this way of, of getting their minds to be more in control of what they're trying to learn. I, I've got an online teacher training program in my books principals and teachers from 17 countries and that, and a, a new one can share the information at the end if you're interested. But what's very important really right now is that, as I said, it's not, it's not really that, what, how can we make the children learn better? Is how can we prevent the distractions that stop them from learning? Now, as I've explained to you, a lot of children don't believe, students don't believe in their ability because they didn't learn the rule, they see other students doing it, therefore they witness people doing something they think they can't and they lose interest. This is a big problem. And it's tremendous for the teacher to go along and say, you know, well, done. I like what you're doing. It'll, it's a very, very important role, role of the teacher. Now, if we, I want to talk to you just for a moment. This is very, very important here. You know very well that we have, you know, we have a brain and inside the brain, of course, it's made up of very, well, there are two kinds of brain cells, but the neurons are, are really the ones that pass the information mainly. Glia cells do a little bit, but it's the neurons. And if you imagine that this is one neuron and this is another neuron, well, the neurons, they don't touch. There is a gap. We call this a synaptic gap. And so what happens is that information will, will move through a neuron as electrical impulse. It'll get to the end, it'll be carried by a chemical to the next neuron, and so signals move through the brain alternating between chemical, electrical, chemical, electrical. Now we have 50 of these chemicals, neurotransmitters, but there is one called cortisol that's very, very important. It's so important that teachers really don't understand very much about it. Cortisol is there to save your life outside the classroom inside the classroom it can disturb your opportunities in life it works like this you imagine you're walking in the countryside and it's a blue sky green fields you know green trees you're happy you're emotionally relaxed and you look down and you see a, a red flower very interesting and you start and you analyze this flower you remember other flowers that you've seen you're comparing the, the shape the texture the smell with your memory you have a learning experience, no problem. Then you hear a noise and you see a snake and your mind says danger. Now, when your mind, according to the level of danger, it causes a change in the chemistry of the body. You know, we call this flight, uh, fight or flight uh, response. But it's a change from the uh, sympathetic, sorry, parasympathetic to the sympathetic nervous system. But at a very beginning, at the initial level, this idea of uh, danger, it causes the chemical uh, cortisol right, to, to overproduce. Yeah, these chemicals are always alternating. But the chemical cortisol overproduces, it floods the frontal cortex, and this blocks the synaptic gap. So the brain's, brain cells are not transferring information. They can't do that because the cortisol is blocking it. This means that you go to a brain freeze. You're looking at the flower, and you're looking at the flower, and you're looking at the fly, and just nothing is happening. You're physically seeing it, but you're not understanding what you're seeing because the, the synapse is blocked. This is causing your brain, another part of your brain, to think about how to physically move away from danger and save your life. But in the learning environment, this cortisol level is very, very easily triggered if a child is abused at home or if a child is bullied in school or if a child is intimidated by other children or, or laughed at, if the social identity is in danger because the children are laughing at them because they've got a big nose or the hair is the wrong color or they, they come from a different caste or anything like that where they're ostracized by other children, then that child will think of a sense of danger and that impression of danger will call the cortisol to rise and they won't be able to think clearly in the lesson. Now, i give you two examples of this. So I, I, once I was teacher training in Nepal, and I was teaching the teachers how to do a mind map. 
Now the mind map has a nucleus ascent with different roots of it. And I was doing it about mathematics. I was explaining how to remember, you know, uh, mathematics. And I asked the invited the teachers to give me names for these roots. And one teacher shouted um, trigonometry. Then I wrote trigonometry. Another sh teacher shouted algebra. No, I wrote it algebra. But the maths teacher, well, they shouted geometry. Now, my mind said it's geometry. But then I thought, this is a maths teacher. They know more than me. And suddenly I thought, there's 50 people looking at me. Is it G or is it J? And for a fraction of a second, I doubted my own confidence. And then with the idea that all these people are looking at me and I couldn't make a mistake, danger, cortisol came up, flooded my brain, and I could not see that word. I could not spell the word geometry. It was impossible. I, I just... It was just a blank space. I couldn't spell this simple, that's a very short word. And it was a great example to me how easily this cortisol can be triggered in another human being at any age. Now, I remember I was watching one teacher, um, one, one teacher and, um, in a classroom, and he came in. He was a very, very bad teacher, a nice person, but a bad teacher. And he would write, write on the board. And, and then he would say, okay, do you understand? And all the children said, yes, sir. Now every single child said, yes, sir. But they don't understand, that's very obvious. However, he didn't understand that. And he wrote some more, and then he shouted out, do you understand? And the students, students said, yes, sir. And then, of course, the teacher then noticed one boy at the back who had completely didn't understand, his mind had drifted, he was looking out of the window. And the teacher said to him, boy, stand up. What did I just say? And the boy stood up. And I know from the look on his face that he was so embarrassed that danger, cortisol came up, and he couldn't think. And he was looking at the teacher, and he was looking at the board, and his mind just wasn't working. He was just blank-minded. And um, the teacher got more angry and said, boy, tell me, what did I say? And the more the teacher shouted, the less the child could understand. Uh, to respond. So I told the boy to sit down. But what was interesting for me, for the rest of that lesson, that boy looked at that board as if he understood every single thing the teacher was talking about. He was like this. Now I knew that his mind was, was unable to learn, to learn anything. <clears throat> but he was so terrified the teacher would ask him again that he gave the performance of understanding. Of course, that tricked the teacher. <laughs> And uh, the child didn't learn anything in that lesson. Probably he didn't learn anything for the rest of the day if the cortisol level was high. But this brings us to a, a very interesting and important thing. It is so easy for this cortisol to be, to be triggered. You know, if you're a teacher and you're very stern or very authoritative, it can trigger this in sensitive children. You won't see it happening, but they won't understand you. And then you'll think that they're stupid because they're not understanding what you're saying when it's your personality that triggered this cortisol to stop them from learning. But if you're a very good teacher and you walk around helping students, it, it may be that your presence makes a student feel that they are less able than the student next to them. And that can be a sense of danger, and the cortisol can come up, and then they'll have trouble to understand what you're saying. So you've got to be very, very careful about how cortisol can be so easily triggered now, cortisol comes up when there's a sense of danger. It comes down when you're happy. So if you make your lesson fun and interesting, and with a sense of humor, then the cortisol level will be down, the children will be able to concentrate on you and not distract you, and therefore they'll be able to learn the lesson, what you're trying to teach them very, very well. Um, let's, let's have a, a break a little bit. and. Uh, New one, can you ask uh, some questions from the audience, please? Uh, thank you very much, Roy. Okay, so we start with one by one. Okay, so we have a one question says that, it says uh, you, you were mentioned about the losing teachers in like in Britain as well as in USA. So the teachers are leaving the uh, like, teaching career. So they're asking that, 
if the teachers start leaving the career, is there a possibility less qualified teachers coming into the system and the education system, there will be a collapse in the education system? What is your opinion about it? A collapse in the education system. <clears throat> Well, you know, I, I tend to find that the best teachers are really teach. you know, it's very normal for a teacher that, you know, they go, they go to school, they go to university, they go to teach a training college, they get a certificate, and they go into the classroom. And then they are trying to understand how to give information to children who don't want to learn. So they kind of develop a kind of authority trying to control the children. But the best teachers tend to be those who've done different jobs and have a life experience before they go into teaching, because then they know more how to reach the human being and control the students more with interest rather than by you know, uh, discipline. I actually went to a naval college and we had a subject called maritime law. It was the most boring subject you could ever imagine. But it was, it were, but the teacher was made it fantastic because he was a retired sea captain and he was always telling stories and anecdotes that made the whole lesson really interesting. So everybody loved the lesson and therefore they did well in the subject because of the character of the, of the teacher. Um, so I don't think uh, it, it will, it's a deterioration if unqualified teachers come into the system What's really important is the natural ability of the teacher or the, you know, the human being to inspire the students to want to learn. And because you know, we all, they learn by themselves. Students just learn by themselves. The teacher doesn't really teach them. All the teacher does is to help the child to keep up with the rules they didn't understand. You know, if you do this, you do this, and you can do that. But the human mind can learn to solve its own problems if they start off from that level. The problem is, is that, you, well, you can't really see here, but if this is the beginning level of some rules, and this rule, and this rule, and this rule, and this rule, well, if they've kept up, it's no problem. The problem is, is that m many of the children, uh, you know, whatever, 90% whatever, they misunderstand this rule. And therefore, as this build up, this rule they don't understand, so they can't solve this problem. That's really what learning is about, teaching is about. It's about helping the students to want to keep up. Now, this brings into motivation. Um, and this is a key factor, especially now we've gone to this, you know, online teaching, is to motivate the students to want to learn. In my class, uh, grade nine, <clears throat> um, you know what happens, the reality. The parents say, go to school, the child puts their uniform on, they go to school, they sit in the classroom, the teacher says, do this, do this, do this. Children go home, they play the game. There's no meaning for them to go to school unless they want to be a doctor or an astronaut. But most children have no purpose. So I said to uh, this class, like, I want you to, to find out what you want to do in your heart for the rest of your life. What would make you happy? Because 75 jobs to read because they've gone for the money but then they get trapped in it and they can't get out of it and it's not fun it's it's unhappy so what what do you think you would like to and so don't worry about the job just tell me what you like do you like to work with young people old people engines computers animals what is it nature what what makes you interested and they would come up well i like this and i like that but then i would find a job in the area that they like the subject we would identify with the pros and the cons of that job, how much money they would get, what could they, what could they buy with this money? They're a, they're a route. So, okay, I'm here now, and if I get these grades, I can go to this college. If I get those grades, then I can go to, well, university, whatever it is. Then I can get this job experience, then I can do this job. And then it was amazing. It really helped them to give a, to put more energy and more effort into the assignments they were given uh, by the teacher because it gave them the purpose to want to learn. So my friend, I, it's a very in interesting question. And I think that it's not so much if, if the uh, substitute teacher is qualified, but that they have the heart 
to want to help the children to keep up and to want to learn by themselves. And I know it sounds a bit strange to say teachers don't teach, but teachers really inspire the mind of the students to want to learn. Let's, let's begin to understand that. Okay. Right, thank you very much, Roy. So we have, a, uh, that question is from one of our participants from Ukraine. So most of your names, I can read them. So we have another participant, like one of our friends from Nepal. So he's asking, uh, according to now, since you have more experience in Asian culture, Asian education system, what will be the future of teachers in Asian countries like Nepal, Pakistan, India, and Sri Lanka? So how do you see like those teachers in the future? So what will be their future? <clears throat> well, I think what we need to understand, of course, is the technology, developing technology is making the world smaller and smaller. And so I don't see a region or a country difference or a zone difference between the, the, the future of the teacher. I see that all teachers or rather all schools will face more and more into the digital world where the children will be less work, uh, able to interact. But having said this, you know, of course, in Nepal, in uh, Pakistan, in India, there are very many poor children. And these children, they, they can't uh, often afford a computer or they can't afford a smartphone. So it's going to be more difficult for them to actually keep up with the learning process if the country system goes more online. That's very obvious now. You know, we, we see that so clearly in Pakistan. There are children who are able, whose parents support them computers, that's great. But there are so many poor children who can't afford that. And therefore they just had no education at all. For the past three months, zero education, nothing. Um, so there's a big, and we must always be aware that the purpose of education is to create differences in ability so that some will do different jobs in the working world. So we need schools to produce professional classes, accountants and lawyers, and the managerial class, and the computer, the engineering class, and the working class, the, you know, the manual workers. It's what school does. And it roots children through this system by using the language skills I've explained to you. So my friend, I don't think that the situation will be any different in Nepal. I, I, I've been to Nepal twice and I've been um, you know, in Kathmandu, the, the city, and of course Pokhara. But I also went trekking into the Himalaya to reach remote and isolated communities. Because there I wanted to talk to the parents. What we don't understand really is that the role of the parents is fundamental in the development of the child's school ability. Because it is the parent who gives the child the, child the inspiration, the self-belief, the, the ability to want to do something and believe that they can do something. And before school, as I've explained, they can teach them skills that, to prepare them for school. The big problem that we've, we've got is that so many parents in every country of the world, England, Canada, Australia, wherever it is, many, many parents, you, know, you might say 80% as an example, they just believe we'll create a child, we love the child, and when the child is five or six years old, we'll give the child to the teacher and the teacher will do all the teaching. That's the biggest mistake that parents make because the teacher doesn't have time for those children. All the teacher can do is give information and try to help a bit here, a bit here, a bit here, but it's the desire of the child to want to learn that makes the difference and the background that they come from. So my friend, um, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Africa, South America, wherever, the educational process will become more digitalized. Computers, teachers will begin to be phased out. And, and we may well imagine that in some future time, there may be no teacher, but a classroom of 100 computers, 100 students, and the human instructor telling them to behave, sit down, press the button, and stop messing around. And, and uh, it, it may well happen sometime in the future. Um, but uh, when you talk about Nepal, and I was very happy in the countries I go to, 
Um, we, we, well, of course, Nepal right now has a political problem uh, with the change in the school system for the private schools. But we, we basically just need to have, just get, just, you know, just give love. Just give empathy, compassion, and tolerance, and help the children to believe in themselves and help the children to, to be inspired to want to learn. And, and that's the magic thing. So thank you very much, uh, Roy. So, so I think with that, you answer the question of uh, Michael from Australia. He has asked whether artificial in intelligence will replace teachers. So you are saying that in some day it will happen. Okay, we have another question from Finland, from Marco, one of our like very good friends. How do you see the model of democratic education solving the problem of bad teaching? <coughs> Could you pre repeat that question again? How would yes. democratic education... How would you see the model of democratic education solve the problem of bad teaching? Uh, I'm not sure what Marco... I, I mean, I, Marco is a friend of mine, but I don't understand what the, te the definition of democratic education means. Uh, I could generalize and imagine that it, it's a, a quite an open, open question where the teacher um, develops the learning of the students through open questioning rather than just giving information. This is a democratic uh, model. Um, and I'm sorry, and <laughs> please, I'm sorry, my, my mind's got a bit tight, confused. Just tell me again what Marcus' question is. Uh, he's asking the how the democratic education will solve the problem of bad teaching. Oh, okay. The biggest problem is changing the mindset of the teachers to have the confidence to be able to use this democratic education. And as I've explained to you before, teachers are kind of nervous about sharing the authority that they have because they're frightened that the children will ask them a question they can't answer and they'll look stupid in front of the other children. This is a big fear of uh, teachers. Personally, I admit that I'm just a human being and only God or other, or, or whoever you, your God is, knows the all, everything. And I think that when I do this, so I show my infallibility, then the students respect that and feel that, oh, the teacher doesn't know everything, therefore I don't have to know everything, I can learn. And so to me, um, the ability of the teacher to encourage the students to, to interact, um, it, would, would overcome many aspects of the bad teaching. If we think of bad teaching as being the inability of the teacher to present information. But bad teaching can also mean uh, a bad, a bad man a bad personality teacher. I know teachers who are vindictive. I know parents who, are, who know that the teacher's no good, but are frightened to complain because they know the teacher will give their child low marks. This is the reality. But, um, but in a, in, a, in, a, in a very simple answer, Marco, and it's a good question, I think democratic education, if it's developed well, will solve many of the bad teaching ethics that we have. Okay. So we have another question from Farsana from Pakistan. So she's asking, now we have multi-intelligence skills. The students, they do have multi-intelligence skills. And she asked if the teachers had lack of attention on early stage of these children, will they lose these multiple intelligence skills? So this is a very, this is a very important question. Okay, <clears throat> let me explain to you that <clears throat> there is no part of the brain that has intelligence. The idea that we have intelligence comes from a man called Charles Spearman in 1904. Now what happened was in the 19th century, they didn't know what intelligence was, and we still argue about what it is today. But the intelligence in the 19th century also involved many social factors. For example, if you're a criminal, if you're religious, these are also tied in with your ability to think. Now, for a particular reason, as we moved into the 20th century, there was, a, and we became more industrialized, there was a need to find a way to categorize children, to find out who could do what kind of jobs. In other words, 
we were trying to test them to find out how good their brain was so that they could do different kinds of jobs. And Charles Spearman came up in 1904 with the idea, look, let's forget about what intelligence might be made of. Let's just say that we inherit something and it develops. And that was the beginning of what they call the nature natural ratio or defect, how much you inherit and how much can be developed. But Spearman also said that one day we will find a part of the brain that deals with intelligence. Well, we never have done. And so we do not have intelligence. Our brain develops schemas or we inherit schemas that enable us to relate to the world about us. And we develop this largely through our emotional interest and sense of security. And it begins very soon, well, it begins in the fetus stage because the emotions of the mother is fed to the fetus. But it also, of course, develops in the neonatal and the infant child. So we don't have intelligence. Intelligence is only a word that we've developed to try to evaluate the language skills of two individuals, how they are able to respond to information. Now, whether it's verbal or whether it's written, we evaluate their intelligence on their language skills. Um, there was a man called Gordon, I think it was 2009, I'm not so sure. He went into the Amazon jungle and he worked with a Periri tribe who had, had no contact with uh, uh, you know, civilization, advanced civilization, very primitive people. And their language is very simple. They counted in one, two, or many. So if you said to one of these natives, I want you to take three fish, they didn't understand what you meant. If, you, if they said, I want you to bring 23 trees, they didn't understand, they would just bring many because they didn't have the language to, to understand how to relate to information. As for example, so language is fundamental to the ability of the brain to relate to the world and then respond to it. Um, um, so, I mean, for example, there are many IQ tests uh, which try to prove that white people are more intelligent than black people. And they're all wrong. They're all based on lies and fraud. Uh, you know, I mean, I can go into a great deal of depth about that. You know, I mean, the book, The Bell Cave in 1995, uh, tried to explain that black people were, or African Americans were 15 points less intelligent on the scale of intelligence than white people. This is completely wrong. It's just fabricated lies. Or they're, 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 they just falsified the data to make this political statement, which did have an effect. Um, so, um, <laughs> I, my brain is my brain's getting a bit confused now what we're talking about. Um, so basically, we do not have one intelligence, then we do not have nine intelligences. Howard's idea was great for a psychological debate, but in reality, we, we align or we relate to the world about us through our interest. So, you know, these nine intelligences, uh, how well you into how well you, you know, music, or spatial, or something like that, they're just a, a way that you develop through your interest to relate to the world about you. Now, this, but you bring a very important point because you have to understand that education is really designed to produce two classes of people, the manager and the managed. And it uses a lot of strategies within society and within the educational mechanism to make sure that children do not get equal opportunity because the system doesn't want it. It pretends it does. So that people are happy and people buy into it. And it'll explain to them, you know, so they come up with ideas that teach us, oh, this is great. I'll do this and now the children will learn better. So it was like Watson's SR formula, stimulant relationship. So the children, the teachers learned that, took it into the classroom, made no difference. You said have one child that really understood and the rest are confused. Then we came along with, you know, um, uh, um, multiple intelligences made no difference. One child still understood, the rest are confused. Now we have learning styles now. Learning styles is great if you've got one teacher and one student. When you've got two students, 20 or 30 students, it's a complete waste of time. You can't alter the info where you give information unless you, unless you use all those skills to teach all the children. So for example, when I teach something, I, I explain it audio, I, I explain it in reading and with a hands-on demonstration. So they are using all their senses uh, as much as I possibly can do. 
But the idea of learning styles means that you use one style with one student, a different style with another student. And you can't do that with a class of students. So my friend, don't think, of, don't think that there are nine intelligences or multiple intelligences. Just think that you have a class of minds who are confused, who are insecure, and just need a lot of love and a, a bit of help to keep up with the rules they didn't understand. That's all. <clears throat> okay. Thank you, Roy. So we have Michael from Australia. He's asking, do you mention something about racist hybrid education right after COVID-19? So he just wants to like clarify a little bit about it. Sorry, can you say that again, please? Uh, so he said mm -hmm. that you mentioned racist hybrid education after COVID-19. So he wants to like, you want to like little bit elaborate it. What did you like really mean from that? Yeah, yeah. What I meant by that was that before, before this pandemic began, there was in a sense one way of teaching. The teacher would go into the classroom and the teacher would teach physically by their presence. But the pandemic has changed all that. Now we have developed the teacher being in a distant location, teaching their children online. And my fear is that School systems have bought into this online education. They have spent money. They have bought Zoom licenses. They have bought um, applications. And they also have to assess a student ability online. So that once we go back to normality, there will, there, there will be a tendency for the, the mindset behind education, or the accountants, whatever it is, the bureaucracy, to still hold on to this online way of teaching. So that they will try to create, they'll try to mix it so that education in the future may be, may be one part physical in the classroom and another part teacher teaching from home. This is what I mean by a hybrid system. <clears throat> All right. Okay, we have another question from Abdul Kader. So you showed a diagram that zone of proximal development. So Vygotsky's proximal zone of proximal development diagram, you just like showed. Yeah, so he's asking how it helps pupils to develop their mental abilities. So how the, oh. how, <clears throat> yeah. Okay, let me go to the screen here. I think it was this one. <clears throat> okay, uh, now this, uh, Vygotsky, um, Lev Vygotsky was fundamental in realizing the importance of intelligence through language. Um, unfortunately, he died, I think it was 1930s, but, um, uh, and his work wasn't known in the West until about 1970. Then, you know, uh, we began to hear about him. But he created this idea of what he called the zone of proximal development. Now, as I explained, the blue circle in the center this is what the child knows. This is what the students know. The yellow on the outside is what they do not know. This is the lesson that they are going to experience. And the green is where the teacher helps them to understand uh, what they're going to teach them. It just means that rather than say, okay, do you understand this? Okay, now we're going to do about that. And instead of letting the children do it by themselves. Do you remember what I told you about Piaget in the very beginning? I explained the Jean Piaget. He had the idea that children learn best by themselves. And that tended to cause the teacher, some teachers, to move into the background to let children develop through their own experiences. The problem with that was the, child's, they were, the child was evaluated on the result they gave, but there was no recognition that, that, ex, that their development came from the home background, how they'd been taught to think in, at home, and how they'd been uh, injured or helped during the learning process. They were just merely judged on the result. But Vygotsky said, no, no, we must help the children to understand what's happening, to teach them. So when we're talking about mental competence, uh, as Michael, uh, as Sir Abdullah explained here, we're talking about the ability of the ability of the brain to adapt to a situation so it can learn. And, and um, it's easy for me to have a chalkboard. I, I can't really do anything on the screen. 
Um, but it's just a question of teaching, you know, that's all. Um, let me, you know, there is a, just an example. Um, there was a man called Andreas Petra. He was from Hungary. And Petra was very interested in children who had motor problems, you know, that they couldn't walk or they couldn't move their arms or something like that. And he developed a system called conductive education. And it's very, very successful in helping children who have motor problems. And it is that the teacher or the conductor helps the child to let, I can't really see it here, but just for example, supposing that I can't move my arm and I want to use the glass, the teacher would say, well, just move your arm. But if the child doesn't know how to use the muscles, they can't do it. So the conductor would explain that they have to move the wrist, they have to turn the arm, and they have to use these muscles slowly, slowly, slowly. So they're helping the child to, to, to actually make this connection, this learning process. And that's really what we're talking about here, is the sensitivity. You know, we, we talk a lot, really, about the brain working. But it's, it simply comes down to sensitivity. For the brain to analyze information, it goes through three phases. We interrogate information, we listen or we read, and, or we see, and then we relate that to information we've stored previously, you know, we're making a connection, association, and then we explain our mind presentation. And all these come down to emotion. If the student is emotionally interested, to want to listen to the teacher, to want to read the words, then they will capture this information clearly, or they'll read it very specifically, and this, this very precise information will go into the memory circuits, the hippocampus, and there it'll relate very clearly to information they saw previously. They know the answer, solved it, problem. I'm sorry, I keep forgetting to go back to the screen, so sorry about that. So they, they can solve the problem. I'm getting confused with this flip-flopping. Um, um, yeah, <laughs> um, I'm losing track here. Um, we're talking too long. I need a break. Um, okay. Um, next question, please. Okay. So we have Dr. Muhammad Tamimi from Palestine. So he's asking, do you see alternative assessment as a good tool to be used to replace exam? Do you see alternative Sorry. as a good tool to replace exam? Alternative assessment. Is it a good tool to replace exams? When I explained to you that I failed school and I went back when I was 20, I did extremely well in examinations because every week we did exams and I learned exam strategies and I learned to, well, to memorize. Well, examinations is just memorizing information. But I did, well, I did, you know, I, I was the very best because I'd learned the exam strategies and I'd learned how to, put, to understand the question, put the information in the right way. The problem with examinations is that children very seldom have the confidence for the exam, so they get very nervous, so that they have a bit of stress, and therefore they can fail the exam or do poorly because of this factor of stress. In other words, they weren't prepared for it. Now, assessment, it has to be realized that when the teacher is assessing the student, they're also assessing their ability to teach the student, but well, that's not recognized. So, um, a gradual assessment, if, if the assessment is based on a dialogue, where the assessor spends time to ask a question and judge the response of the student, then I think that's more effective in understanding the ability of the student. However, in Denmark, they uh, evaluate a student's competence by a written exam and by a verbal examination, but they give no um, experience of verbally uh, explaining your mind. So a, a, a child who knows the answer, when asked a verbal question, won't have the language skills or the competence to explain their mind, so the teacher will think that they don't know very well. Um, I, I think that really any kind of assessment just shows the quality of the teacher. It shows the quality of the teacher.
Uh, I can't. I can't hear. Um, new, new one. I, I. I've got no sound. Oh, no, it's fine, right? Okay. So thank you very much, Troy. So we are going to go for our last question for the day. So then, then what will happen? Now you know that there are plenty of questions to be answered. So after finishing at the end of the session, uh, Roy will show his. Uh, he will give his contact details and how to log into his training sessions. So then, what you can do is you can ask the questions. You can ask questions directly from him. So the last question I am going to select from Bruno Sandler. I think he's from Germany. He's asking now. We were talking about democratic education, so that means the students can decide what they should learn. So, if it has a value, the Bruno is asking why is not practicing in the mainstream teacher education? Why is not there in the mainstream teacher education? Why they do not practice about this democratic education concepts? Well, you know. The purpose of education originally was not to teach children how to learn. It was to give them rules by which they would conform for the social, for the social world, so that they would give them a sense of discipline. So, you know, like hundreds of years ago, school was not about teaching children how to learn. It was about teaching them how to behave socially in school. But then uh, as our technology developed, so we began to teach them to read and write and you know, various subjects. Um, so if we go to the basic understanding of school, it really is not to teach children how to learn. School doesn't actually teach children how to learn. It, it, it is simply a, a system that, that evaluates a child's ability to respond to information and judges their ability on that so they can do a work, work role. So we may say there is a social strategy or a political strategy that may hinder uh, um, a, a good uh, educational system like you're suggesting now. But there again, you know, education is traditionalist. It, it is based on tradition and people, traditionists, they don't like change. It takes a long time for a, a traditional mind to change. It'll come through the complaints of the parents by, um, by statistics showing that children learn better in this way rather than other ways. But then there's a whole mechanism that needs to change. We are still pumping out textbooks. We are still teachers thinking, oh, this is the way I must teach. You know, come into the classroom, sit down, open your textbooks, give me the textbooks, I'll mark, see you next week. You know, we are still in this mindset. And I think this idea of a democratic education is, is, is new. It is relatively new. I know that um, many teachers will not have heard of that. Um, and, but, but there again, as I've explained, it, it also relies, you're putting more, um, more, more value on the ability of the teacher to teach. So that if you have a good teacher who's able to, as I explained before, who's able to say, okay, I don't know everything, let's learn together, and you can help me as I can help you, that's great. But many teachers, they can't do that. They cannot do that. And so they would say, I don't want that. I just want to go in a classroom and tell them to use the textbooks, which of course is totally wrong. But it's, it's a phase. Um, it's, it's a phase. So we may develop it more, um, I, I think. <clears throat> right. Thank you very much, Roy. So we had like, today's evening, we had Roy Anderson with us. So it was like a marvelous session. So like we learned a lot. I think all of you have like more questions. So, and also don't miss. So we are going to have uh, three more sessions in a row. So we have tomorrow, there'll be voice 2020. There'll be like kids around the world. They will raise their voice about the education. Then on Sunday, we have Professor Michael Gebauer coming into our session. Then in Monday, we'll have Marco Koskinen. And Tuesday, so we are expecting to have Lena Krauss from Germany. So that's our session, plan session at the moment. So I think most of you have doubts. So you want, you might be expected to get the contact with us from Roy, with Roy Anderson, Mr. Roy Anderson as well as. So you might be interested to take part in his events. So he's doing plenty of training sessions and everything. So you can, and also he's a very good author. So I'm just reading two of his books these days. So you should read it. They're absolutely marvelous. So Roy, so if you can share those details with our audience, so that will be great. So that will be.
I think, yeah. Um, so uh, you're very welcome to contact me on LinkedIn. I, I just got two, I just got 20,000 people. I, I've been trying for years and years to get 20,000 and I got it uh, yesterday. So it was a big thing for me. And on Facebook. Um, and my email address is royandersen95 at gmail.com. And on YouTube, Roy Anderson Education, there are about 100 videos. Um, they're all free, you know, just thoughts on education and learning. And I have a, a website, www.andersenroy.com, which tells them more about me and the books that I've written and the teacher training process. And you're always very, very welcome to invite me to talk and to share thoughts, and whatever, because, because we need to work together. And as the gentleman before in asked the question, why isn't democratic education being more enforced? It's because we are not, we are not sharing enough thoughts. We need to share our thoughts more with ourselves and of course with our children. It's been a great delight and you want to thank you. Thank you. All right. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Roy Anderson. So it was a great evening. So we had participants from Palestine, Africa, so Asia, Australia, like Europe, from Finland and Germany. So thank you very much. We only miss USA. I know that it's very early in the morning from USA. So thank you very much all around the people in the world. So I hope you will contact with Roy Anderson in the future. So follow him. So get more ideas. So he's like huge fossil resource. You can get it's like a full of knowledge. So get as much as possible from him. Thank you, Roy, for joining with us this evening. Thank you, Thank you very much. Okay, see you.